Hello and welcome to a special episode of Solo Wins Lab where we're going to be talking about I don't know. DevOps. Oh, DevOps. That's awesome. Yeah, DevOps and DevOps tools. Only we cool. can't really do it, I don't think, well necessarily okay. from this desk. Oh, no? In lab coats. What we should do is go to Las Vegas and talk oh. about it there. Oh, I like that idea. Can I use the door? No. Welcome to reInvent and welcome Patrick for finally getting here. So why are we here? We're here, I'll tell you why we're here, not just us, but everybody in general. Three things, right? Three things I've noticed. Uh, one, people want metrics, they want data. They want the ability to, and this is two, the ability to log all of those metrics. Right. Right. And then three, they want to do analysis on the logs that have those metrics. You know what I call that? Uh, let me guess. What? Uh, observability. Observability. And observability is one of those terms from uh, that thing that people like to believe in, that sorcery called DevOps. DevOps, yes. And so DevOps is a thing, right? You can buy that? Yeah, sure. I buy DevOps off the shelf at my grocery store. Mm -hmm. Don't you? It's not marketing at all. It's not overloaded. It is totally a marketing term for something that has existed probably throughout human history. DevOps really isn't a thing. It's more of a process. It's more of a process. Well, and especially, I mean, like our shirts, right? You know, more dev, less up. The, it's, it's interesting the way I've had so many comments on the shirt, and everyone seems to be taking it the same way, which is basically automation is good. It's been good for 5,000 years. The wheel was good. Steam was good. I never Elect thought of the wheel as automation, but sure. Okay, but electricity was good, right? The idea of uh, robots are good. The idea of being automation illuminate, uh, eliminates drudgery yeah. and toil, and that is the whole point of what DevOps is supposed to be about. It's not eliminating operations. It's getting rid of the drudgery so that you can focus on actually making a difference and accomplishing your goals. Okay, so this is a DevOps show then. Mm, it's a developer show, maybe, kind of, no. What do you think? Is it a cloud show? Sort of. Sort of? You're yeah. getting closer. What yeah. do you think? I think what you're looking at is the world's largest infrastructure conference. Think about everything that you have here. You have people who, and it's all about the data. Right. So you have people and companies here focus on the storage of your data, the migration of your data, the ability to report on that data, mm -hmm. the high availability, disaster transformation. recovery, transformation, everything you need to do, and of course all the JSON, like, JSON's everywhere. Well, you included JSON, so we're now JSON compliant. But, but all that data is hosted in AWS. They are providing the infrastructure. They are on track to become essentially the world's largest MSP. That's true, because what do MSPs do? Uh, they back up your data. They, right, they restore your data when you need it. They, help, they give you tools to solve problems, performance insights. They help you with analytics. Um, what else? Mm, well, some of them will you know, reset your printer, but I mean, for the most part, well, it sounds like what you're really saying though, or maybe I'll take a huge jump. All right. Is does it mean that cloud is essentially data as infrastructure and that all the rest of this is just plumbing and tools that enables that? Wow, data as infrastructure. Like, to, it's not thinking about the physicality of infrastructure. It's not servers and chat. It's really distilling it back down to the thing that actually matters, which is your data. Right, and what company would want your data more than, say, Amazon? Uh, maybe Microsoft. Mm. These are the companies that want your data because if they have your data, they have your business, right? That's absolutely right. And that's why we're here. Yeah, well, it is kind of interesting too because I mean, DevOps is obviously an overloaded term, yep. and so much of it. I was thinking about uh, uh, talking to a customer the other day, and he was talking about how um, it, there's you know uh, disagreements between teams, and they don't trust each other, and maybe they don't get along. And, and he's coming from sort of a traditional on-prem IT environment, which is you know all about cost savings and SLA and the rest of it, and they're they're being tasked with innovation goals and a lot of other things. And so they're trying to incorporate. They they've basically been told to get DevOps by the end of 2019. Right, and you, you don't do that. Yeah. But, so they're trying to pick up best practices, but I was thinking about it, I'm like, and I don't think everything goes back to an Apollo uh, analogy, but if you think about the Apollo F1 engine, right, there's that, that myth that they can't rebuild the Saturn V because they lost all of the blueprints, which of course is completely ridiculous. They have, NASA has all of the details of everything about that program, but literally they started, you know, pulled a bunch of uh, F1 engines out of uh, storage to take a look at them for the SLS program with the idea of being thinking, well, maybe we'll do this instead of SRB boosters, right? And the conclusion was, we can't build them. And the reason we can't build them is because, it's not that we don't have the blueprints, but there was, you know, 
there was skill, there was special knowledge that the welders and the other engineers who built them had that there were notes on paper and that they were lost a long time ago, right? So the solution was the new, the new kids at NASA went and redesigned a lot of 3D printed technology, were able to dramatically reduce the part count and basically built a, a design for an engine that you could build now today with today's technology that would eliminate the problem of not having that engine, right? Yeah. Now bear with me. So I'm in terms of the, with you. In terms of the skepticism, there are those who might say, if you were a younger engineer at NASA, they would say, oh, all you old timers, you know, you, you, you didn't bother to document your code, right? They effectively didn't keep those notes around and prevented the, us to have the ability to rebuild the engine now. Yeah. But those old timers would say, okay, hold on a second. Um, we managed to send humans to the moon uh, 50 years ago. Where's that engine that you designed? Just show me one of those, right? Get off my lawn. Right, so, so that, 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 that dichotomy of we have a great idea and we have a great plan, sort of the dev focused, along with engineers and operations right. who is like, but we actually do it. We actually right. provide the technology and the tools and the services that allow our businesses to continue to operate. So, does that, does that work for you? Because I know that you have works for me. Like that, that. But that's what I meant by saying, saying one word, process. It's a process, it's a, it's a way for you to essentially do business, to do IT, to do it properly, right. to have teams that are integrated. Now, I'm old enough to remember when we called DevOps Synergy, and we just said we need more synergy around here, right? That's the, about the same amount of marketing. <laughs> but those were the words, because we just needed the teams to be integrated and to be in sync with each other and to understand that, uh, no, you know, what is it that this group needs now or will need in a week from now? And to have people all you know, at the table understanding what everybody's doing, right hand, left hand, all that type of stuff, all the same jargon we've heard for years. Right. But DevOps just encapsulates uh, encapsulate all of that. Yep. And it's really about the process. How is your team, how's your company working? Efficiently or not? And DevOps is that all Big, one big word that just sort of describes all of it, to me. Well, that's, you, that's how I Well, do you feel like really it comes down to an opportunity to collaborate based on tools, right? That the idea that there were these two separate camps with wildly different technology. I mean, you look at the adoption of, um, you know, a lot of existing SolarWinds customers who are now monitoring, monitoring a lot of containers, right? That was something they've got, they're, they're dealing with containers and Kubernetes and Mesos, not just like, you know, single standalone Docker instances, that was going to be DevOps. That was going to be these special new teams and instead Instead, it's a commodity technology, and anything that's commodity immediately is about cost savings, which pushes it into traditional IT, and it ends up being business challenges that need to be solved, and the tools that address them. So I feel like there's an opportunity for dev and ops to really focus on collaborating on tools, right? If I need to drive a nail, I'm thinking about the hammer. If I'm digging a hole, it's about using a shovel. It's like, it's not so much that there's this great philosophy that has to be adopted. And I'm not, I'm not discounting Agile, and I'm not absolutely not discounting the need to really think about culture change, really to instill the idea of feedback loops is something that takes a, a lot of effort from both sides. Developers to make sure that they're baking monitoring and metrics into applications before deployment to make it easier for ops, but then ops committing to make sure that they're sending those metrics back into the development process to improve quality over time. Okay. But I mean, is it ultimately like, it might be the tools that you use and com common tools that work for both groups, it's supposed to me. But the tools you're talking about is just something that help with a part of the process. So for example, containers are a great way to to do test-driven development. It's, it's like the way to do test-driven development, right. right? But that's just a thing you would have already been doing that just took you forever and containers just make it a little bit easier. So it's not, it, is it part tools? I, I guess you could say that, but you know what it really is? To me, it's about if you're going to be data-driven or not. Mm. Are you truly going to be data-driven? Are you going to do things and you're going to let the data dictate and help drive decisions? Or are you still going to operate on a hunch? Right, you're going to spin up all these containers. You're going to do a deployment, and let's say, let's say you do something, uh, you do, um, you deploy something ten times, it succeeds seven, seven out of ten times, it failed right. three times. Um, is that a success? Okay, but now you're getting into like error rate metrics and error no, budgets no, no. and sort of things. What I'm getting into is actually, if it's something being pushed to every desktop, would you want 30% of all desktops to have a failure and be calling IT? As long as it's only the executive desktop upgrades that fail, I, I don't think you'd have a problem. Right, so here's the thing. You would look at somebody and say, no, no, we need like something closer to 100% success rate. This is something user experience. But if the guy in charge of IT says, ah, 
I got a feeling we'll be okay. Let's just go ahead on Friday and deploy this. So it's part tools, but it's also part being a data-driven culture. And I think that's a huge part of DevOps in general is all these different teams have their own area of focus and it's all about their parts of their data. And are they truly letting the data help them make better decisions? Well, but isn't that part of the misdirection around AI and ML? I mean, the whole idea about, you're talking about bias, right? Yeah. Decision bias, conclusion bias. Yeah. So you're saying data helps eliminate human bias. So we're being told that, oh no, AI and ML are the only way to get past that, but really those are both completely dependent on data analysis. So, oh. right? Data and humans. Humans to write the code. Humans and data. So, so you're basically you're saying that one of the primary goals for anyone, regardless of how they come to operations, whether they're cloud focused or they're on-prem, is to really start admitting that they might have everything that they need in the data that they're already responsible for, and to start looking to the data and to not go just based on hunch. Right. I mean, like one of the ones that, that I think is absolutely true, and especially talking to customers here, is how often do we think, like, what are the top 10 problems in your infrastructure? And now you could you immediately could say, I can list the systems, I can list the people, resources, whatever else, budget. Yeah. But if you looked at the data, would it really be those 10? Would it maybe be 10 other ones that you didn't even think no, about? my first would be the data itself. That would be number one, the data. Data's never right. Okay, data's never right? I didn't go to school to become a data janitor, it just sort of happened. Nobody goes to school to be a data janitor, but yet we end up, how much, how much data janitorial services have you done over the years? Oh, I'd probably say, what, 85, 90% of touching data has been janitorial. Exactly, exactly. That's where everybody spends the bulk of their time. Mm. So one of the things I like is this is actually the second year that Lab has been able to come to AWS, right? Yes. And so what are we doing here this year? Well, what we have to do is we have to work. Not just our booth, but we need to walk the floor and we need to figure out, you know, what are the challenges people have? What are the solutions on the floor here that are talk, meant to help talk to, people? Talk to you guys. We have to talk to you guys. So I mean, we've got some work to do. That's what we're doing here. All right, so we're going to have a little fun. We're going to go by the booth, talk to a couple of customers. Uh, there's no fun here. There's no fun at reInvent. No. This is a serious. No, no fun at all. This, this is, is a not serious a, business, there's Patrick. No, there's no boondoggle right. at, at all. We're working hard. So welcome to the booth, and you seem to have survived your date with the uh, unicorn. So you promised me to, it was a unicorn, but it turned out to be Robo Kitty, and I rode Robo Kitty like a boss. And now you're sitting in a chair for some reason. Yes, I'm sitting uh, for no related reason whatsoever. Mm, 
Yeah, well, so hey, let's talk about what it's like here in this booth, because it's a little bit different at this show than maybe where we normally see you at Cisco Live or uh, Microsoft Ignite or maybe VMworld. RSA or VMworld, yep. yep, or certainly at a SWUG. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the conversations here are a little bit different, and we just had one that was, I think, the best one of the show. Absolutely. Not just because it came from a, a really unexpected place, but the, the spirit of what he was saying really, to me, captured what DevOps is all about. So, this is a DBA yes. who is talking about using tools and some new techniques to really bring uh, uh, the ops team, uh, the, the dev team, into operations, right? So what were the two things, what, what, what was driving that for him? Well, uh, I remember the statement he said that he had a goal of wanting to get uh, the tools, the right tools to them that they would want to use. Right. Instead of forcing a tool on them and say, you know, this is the direction, this is where we're going to go. He goes, no, no, let's figure out what it is they, they want and need right. and give it to them. Because it, because then they would adopt it yes. and feel invited. So what right. I loved about it was his, his spirit, you know, you talk about the culture change of DevOps, was inviting those teams in and instead of it being developers pushing themselves onto, I, onto ops, which never right. works, right. it was someone in ops, and you know, there's a little bit of a reputation among database administrators as being a little focused Salty. on their, oh, or that. But here's someone that literally from the inside of the inside of the onion, yes. right, is the one who's reaching out, pulling team members in, and he was doing it for, for there was a couple reasons. So there was that, it was helping, he was using the tools selection as the, the grease to make that happen. Right. But he was doing it because one, it made his job easier to get those teams involved but also he was acting as a force multiplier because he knew the data. He's the database person, to your point before about it is data as infrastructure, but he's using his knowledge of the data to then, and the importance of data, to get them to collaborate around a database, a, the core of what is traditional operations, to really improve the, the, the delivery of services to his organization. It was amazing, and I'm, I'm hoping that we can uh, bring maybe more conversations from him in the future, but yeah. that, he, he really was was that spirit of what DevOps really is about. It's, it's using development to streamline operations, not replace operations, but to get the ugly stuff out of the way so that you can really focus on doing what you need to do. That's right, drive the business. Driving the business. Yeah. So uh, real quick, we just want to show you a couple things where there is a difference in some of the conversations that we had about what, if you're a, uh, if you're a DevOps team or certainly a developer, you're thinking about, and certainly if you're operating in the cloud, how the, the uh, views that you use among the tools are a little bit different. So let me show you just a couple of them real quick. Okay, so first of all, dashboards, we live and die by our dashboards. Dashboards are a little bit different when you're at cloud scale, right? And it's a combination of infrastructure and events and a whole lot of other stuff that, you know, don't necessarily go together. It's basically uh, apples and oranges for days, right, at enormous scale. So, so for example, here's a dashboard. This is a, this is a uh, uh, Slingbot production dashboard. So this is things like API submissions, uh, consumer messages. Here we got a, a fetcher job process. You know, these are specific to a application that is a cloud native application. But right. It's got some other resources that actually span into hybrid, right? So when you look at the sorts of uh, elements, just the diversity of data that are coming from that are a part of the dashboards that you're using are they're not focused sort of at that host uh, level or this is a VM or this is a network interface. It's a combination of all of them. That's right. right. So the second thing that happens a lot is you normally start thinking about services a little bit differently, right? You don't necessarily know where they're running. You don't have as much of a deterministic view to be able to say, yes, I know all the elements of this app. So what ends up happening is um, host definition becomes a little different. View, like am, is a host the physical host or is it containers that are running on that host? And then the other thing too is you end up with a different view of infrastructure in terms of problems, right? Like heat maps of problems. Like here we're looking at a lot of hot trace data where this is based on a lot of error reporting, right? So almost that definition of infrastructure can change by the minute. It's not, this is my core network and then these are the services that support applications and virtualization. Instead it's where are we in the moment and you start your drill down sort of from the problem view. Okay. Right? 
The other thing that's a little bit different is troubleshooting is really different, right? Especially like here's an application, uh, this is like a, a booking service, right? So this is a horizontally scaled application. There's the front end app and then the main contributor is this database behind it. But in this case, I don't know where they are and they change hosts from minute to minute. So this is where tracing comes in. And that's something that is really new if you're uh, used to working more with uh, traditional uh, IT processes and on-prem. Um, and so for them, they start looking at uh, queries, and it becomes more about outliers, right? So in this case, these are transactions that are flowing through the system. And so I started looking for things in this heat map, like, well, what's going on here? What is, what, is this, what is this one problem in this transaction? So this is a call to a booking service. I'm going to click on that call. And you start thinking instead about all the different layers. So this is an app that's built out of MongoDB, Spring, it's a Java-based application, uh, Faraday, and it runs on Rails, and you end up drilling into calls. So it ends up being more, to your point, about databases that would typically be, am I optimizing this query? More, how many times does that query run? So optimization around data is a little bit different. And when you start looking at what's going on in a database, being able to drill in and do where uh, tracing normally would be, you're looking at the queries that are coming back as a part of, let's say, database performance analyzer. In this case, the trace itself is, is where you're getting the details that were part of, in this case, the database lookup, or maybe it's the URL parameters that are coming through the front end, or it's uh, part of a, a memcache or um, uh, other uh, uh, memory uh, caching service, watching the steps step to step to try to figure out what's driving those weird outliers at high volume. And nothing you've shown here right now says to me host or server or instance of a database. It's, right. just, it's just showing the layers of you know the function, the call, because that's all you care about. The infrastructure is provided by somebody else. Right. So you don't care about that infrastructure anymore. And they right. won't let you care anymore. Yeah, they won't let you care either. Right. You, you it's, can't care. It's parts flying information. Right. But in all of these cases, when we're talking to customers who are having a great experience, who will say, yes, we're, we're doing DevOps, they are, going back to the conversation a second ago, it is where they are collaborating on the tool selection so that they both enjoy that experience, they have a common uh, vocabulary about being able to look at telemetry data yes. across applications, right? So it, it, everyone benefits from that. The other thing that's different is there's also kind of different users. Like if you're a marketing person, if you care about like an external website that's being hosted um, in cloud, for example, or especially when it's pushed out to edge and there's a whole bunch of of uh, local optimization to reduce latency. Being able to look at that from like a, a meta level for the web app is a lot of people are Pingdom customers here. I think I know a lot of you are using Pingdom. What's interesting is that if you're thinking about this a little bit more about development, that next step is not, hey, I'm the, the uh, CMO, is my app web, it's what's the experience? Like, are API calls performing as well as my users are experiencing on their mobile devices? So right. a lot of granularity there to be able to figure out how that's working, and things like, well, you know, what's the, what's the experience by site? Oh, what is this? It's just my blog. It's your blog. Well, how's your blog doing? I, you know what? I have a page speed score of 81, and is that good? So you're a B minus. I'm a B minus, and I could get better. Well, why do you have a? Why do you have a? Part of the reason here is I can see that the uh, header page is fairly large files. Your One, wife takes fantastic pictures of you. It's a beautiful photo. It is a fantastic right? photo. But it's too big. It's too big, so what are you going to do? So I got to have her give me something at a slightly lower resolution. I got to reduce that file size. But for me, I mean, this is the stuff you care about for the end user experience. Now, it only took a couple of seconds to load the page, but half that time was just loading that image. And for me, and living in the US, I can deal with that. I don't think it's a problem. But you know what? Some countries don't have the best networks. Okay, but hosting, hosting this page, you're ops for yourself for this That's site, right? right? But if you are taking it down to the level of caring about how am I going to fix this problem, you're a developer now. That's you're right. You're doing HTML, Himital, and yes. you're now talking about optimizing that image, one of the assets for it, or maybe using a... a, a I could use a CDN in order to get CDN, there faster too. Yeah. But now you're thinking like a developer. Yes. So again, it's that bridge between 
improving quality of service requires a thinking about it more to kind of a component level or the discrete That's data right. that it takes to fix that. Yeah. So again, data driven, right? Data, data here driven. being the size of that file. Purely data driven. I know what to work on next. The data tells me what to do. Uh, the next thing, of course, logs are really important. And yes. one of the things that you were telling us over and over again and folks that we've talked to here is, oh no, 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 there's nothing to pull. Yeah. There is no infrastructure except giant fire hoses of logs that get spit at me that contain the data that I need dashboards made out of. This has been the most popular thing I've talked about uh, this week. Everybody has they, they metrics, they want logs of metrics, and they want to do analytics of the logs of those metrics. Imagine a knock view made of nothing but log-based data. That, data. That would be cool. So they'll use views here, like this is data coming out of uh, CloudTrail that's pulled together into what would look like a traditional dashboard. Beyond that, you'll start to do things like, you know, a lot of them, that first dev step is, well, how do I derive data from that? Because it's not, maybe it's JSON and it's ready to go. Maybe it's an unformatted data type or it's XML or it's something else. So one of the things that they'll spend a lot of time doing is actually creating derived fields from that data that they can take action on. Down here, like automatically created tags. So multi-dimensional tagging becomes a big part of what you're doing. Like, hey, I want to know all of my uh, front end uh, issues or errors that are coming regardless of the system. So there's a little bit more regex, there's a little bit more definition that's a part of that, but the tools are discovery tools in a slightly different way. Like, is regex dev? Oh, regex is just, I, I, there are words I would use to describe regex. <laughs> Words that we can't say on SolarWinds Lab. Uh, I, I'm not sure I would classify it as dev, but then again, I'm not sure I wouldn't. It's, right. hard, it's hard to say. All right, well, and then the last thing that they're definitely talking about is the need to be able to grab logs wherever they may be. That's right. Absolutely. Right, if you have things, a container that only runs for five minutes, it has a terrible error that you needed to catch. Yes. Uh, but be, but also to be able to look at things like log volume, log rate. Uh, the, the live the, tail. The number of people who are using Paper Trail is just delightful. And there is a free tier, by the way, so if you want to play with this or you're kind of a Raspberry Pi now, Arduino, I'm doing more Arduino stuff these days. Uh, if you, being able to capture the events that are coming out of devices, wherever they are is a big part of what operations cares about. And so uh, going back again to that conversation of being collaborative, sort of the spirit of what DevOps actually can be to get beyond the marketing hype, being able as operations to specify, to say, hey, here's a line of code. If you would please drop that into this application or here's, here's the logging definition that should be a part of a container uh, definition so that it automatically is going to, as the orchestrator scales it up or my deployment, Beanstalk is going to deploy that. It's automatically going to ship my logs off to a to the SaaS endpoint and figure out what to do with that, so that I in operations can sort it out later. Again, it's a chance to get past that. I've been waiting on Dev for a week. This thing keeps failing, and it's on me to deal with the the heat from executives. Again, it's that great opportunity to sort of use tools as a common way of of uh, connecting people. So yeah, just magic on toast. Magic, magic is a great word to describe this week, especially for me. So it, I, I don't know if you saw all the keynotes, but it, watch the replays of the keynotes. The keynotes were very heavily focused on data. Yeah. Very much on data. And this is my biggest takeaway uh, for the week. It's, we talked, is this a DevOps show? Is this a cloud show? And no, it's, it's an infrastructure show, but you know what? It's not DevOps, it's data ops. Everything here, everybody, every vendor is all focused on data, one reason or another. For us, we're trying to help people get the right data so they can make better decisions, right? So we have a tool like Logly. That's why people are coming and they're looking at it, they're going, I have logs everywhere. How, what am I supposed to do with it? Oh, we can fix that for you, right? right. I, we know what the pain point is, but it's The problems all, are solvable. Yes, yeah, so Whether it's solvable. us or anyone else. And the conversation I've been having with people, it's always been about my, this, data thing, and how do I do this thing? And we can help with that. So uh, it has been magical because it's very much focused on data operations. That's what, you know, data ops is a thing. And unicorn magic. And unicorn magic, or RoboKitty magic, whatever we want to call it. So RoboKitty's still magic. RoboKitty is magic. So hopefully you notice that the conversations that we're having, that everyone is having here, are really the same thing. There isn't dev, and there isn't ops, and there isn't cloud, and there isn't on-prem. There are delineations that are about data. Uh, all about, about the data. And, but beyond that, there are problems to solve 
And it's really about the tools that people are choosing and their approach to get started. Yeah, and who's hosting your infrastructure? I mean, we've had a lot of people, they come and they say, what do you offer as a service? I don't want to host this stuff anymore. Right. I, I want you to do all that work for me. I just want the data, I want the analysis on it, and I want to be able to make better decisions. That's why we're here, right? It, it's, and it, we're not here for a cloud show. We're not here for, it's not a DevOps show. It's not a developer conference. You know what the people are here for? It's because of the data. They all have different data needs. And the data has to go from here to there, but it's all about data. It's all about getting access to the right data, getting analytics on that data in order to help you make truly a data-driven decision in order to have a positive impact on yourself, your team, your business. That's what this event is all about. So it's, a, it's letting the data inform, or the problems based around managing that data inform the selection the tools that you're using and the approaches that you take. Absolutely. And you know, this has been fun. I really appreciate you having me on Lab. I always enjoy coming out to Lab, but uh, I got a unicorn to tame, and you know what? I heard unicorn bacon is kind of tasty. So, 